Coming up on DTNS, Scott Johnson talks to us about Nintendo's moves against game preservation. Plus, 3G is shutting down, should you be worried? And Meta wants to build a universal translator. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. There is a longer version of this show called Good Day Internet. If you want to hear more of what we have to say, go get it. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons. Today they include James C. Smith, Miranda Janelle, and Justin Zellers. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. At CES last month, Intel launched its 12th gen Alder Lake chips for its H series lineup. Now it's rolling out Alder Lake chips in its P series and U series laptops. Intel says the boosted core counts offer up to 70% better multi thread performance than previous 11th gen Intel and AMD hardware and beat Apple's M1 and M1 Pro chips in benchmark tests, although not the M1 Max. The new chips include Intel's integrated Iris Z graphics, support for Wi Fi 6E, Thunderbolt 4, and PC. CIE 4.0. Somebody filed a public records request with the state of California's Department of Motor Vehicles regarding Waymo's autonomous car operations. Uh, the DMV ran those documents past Waymo, and Waymo asked for certain technical details to be redacted as trade secrets. However, the requester challenged those redactions, so the DMV said, you should sue us, Waymo, uh, to file a lawsuit requesting an injunction against us releasing the redacted data, which Waymo did. Tuesday, California's Superior Court ruled in favor of Waymo's request. Waymo says it will continue to share safety and other data with the public, but that technical data will remain redacted. TechCrunch says the data that was redacted was data from Waymo's application for a permit and involved things like how the system identifies conditions, uh, transfers control back to humans, and how the company addresses incidents. Can't have the DMV knowing that stuff. Well, the DMV Apple, can know it, just not anybody else. Right. <laughs> Apple added a new American Siri voice to the iOS 15.4 beta called Voice 5, although the file name refers to it as Quinn. Apple told The Verge that the voice was recorded by a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Axios describes the voice as sounding more gender neutral than other Siri voice options. The EU proposed something called the Data Act. Uh, to encourage the adoption of Androids. No, no, it's not that. The Data Act encourages fair access to non-personal data and gives small businesses a leg up against big tech. At least that's the idea. The Data Act would require IoT cloud service providers to give a user their own data when they request it and also to provide access to data to third parties in real time. So the idea is if you pay for Nest's cloud service, for example, all your non-personal data would have to be made available for Apple or Wise, et cetera, with your permission, of course. Basically, trying to encourage data to be under the customer's control and not exclusive to any one company. This would make it easier for customers to switch cloud services, big, big part of this. More text is coming on this rule with specific rules for individual tech sectors. Once that's all ironed out, it'll go before legislatures to begin the process of trying to become law. The ISP Frontier had a couple rocky years not too long ago, but it has announced that it now offers a two gigabit per second symmetrical tier to offer its fiber customers for $150 per month. Frontier offers fiber service to roughly 4 million customers across 19 states. Not mine, though. I looked up my address earlier today. AT&T, Google, <laughs> Google Fiber, Verizon Fios, Xfinity, and Zipply Fiber also offer two gigabit per uh, second service, but none of them offer it to all of their customers. And those are just the fiber ones. I think uh, I think there's some some other like wireless ones that can that can do. Well, maybe not two gigabits. You know, I take it back. Probably not two gigabits. So uh, maybe I need to move back to the neighborhood that has. I mean, I, I have so. I have gigabit internet, but it's not symmetrical. Uh, yeah, it looks yeah. pretty good. Mm. All right, Scott, tell us about what Meta is up to. Well, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg, you may have heard of him, demonstrated an algorithm being developed by the company that can change virtual surroundings with voice commands. They showed themselves asking for a beach and picnic tables, seagull sounds, stuff like that. Uh, it's already making the meme rounds, but it's interesting technology. The feature is part of Project uh, Car, sorry, Karaoke, which Care. is... 
K A I. Is it karaoke? Yeah, I know it. It's silly. I hate it. Yeah. Yeah. You think, and if you think I don't like that, wait until I get to the other name of the other thing. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, they're developing a conversational AI in virtual worlds or for virtual worlds. Meta announced a project also to create a universal translator. Now this might have some uh, some feet to it. The idea is to make one system that or that works with all languages. Meta says about 20% of the world's population doesn't speak languages covered by existing machine transla translation algorithms. To tackle this problem, Meta has two techniques. One called No Language Left Behind, hate that name, will work on building models that require fewer training materials. That's helpful for languages that don't have extensive written works or maybe none at all. Maybe it's purely, you know, passed down verbally. The second technique is called universal speech translator, which aims to train an algorithm to translate between languages without needing a written component. So this one elusive Star Trek technology we keep uh, hoping we get to outside of, I guess, replicators, universal translator may be coming. Pretty cool. Uh, yeah. You know, I the 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 only thing that I can really um, compare this to, I guess, is Google Translate, which works pretty well. Uh, anybody who uses it regularly knows that eh, you get the message across. It doesn't necessarily translate as well as it should, but this is on a whole other level. I mean, the idea that twenty percent of the world's population can't even participate in any existing machine uh, algorithms for translation, that surprised me. That's that I, I, I know that there are languages that either aren't written or are under the radar enough that there isn't enough research that has been studied to be able to kind of be part of this this larger initiative. But yeah, that's a lot of folks. Yeah, there, uh, we looked up at the Linguistic Society. Uh, Ethnologue, which is published by SIL International, classified uh, 6,909 distinct languages. So there's more if you count dialects and things like that, but there are 6,909 distinct languages on the planet. Uh, if you put that number in your head, it starts to make more sense when you go to that Google Translate dropdown and there's like, you know, 20 <laughs> in there. I mean, mm. obviously, Mandarin, English... Uh, Spanish, French, uh, Japanese, Korean, you, you've covered a huge part of the population with just those. But there's lots of languages beyond that, not just in certain parts of the world uh, where small populations exist that still speak uh, you know, older languages. But uh, Sarah, you reminded me when we were talking about this before the show that India itself has thousands of languages inside just the borders of India. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think some of those are technically would be considered dialects and not uh, fully separate languages. But yeah, I mean, it's just the the implications of this, should it work well, uh, really, it turns into, you know, I always think of the babblefish, uh, where yeah. you can just understand everything. And this whole, what language do you speak? What language do I speak? How do we figure this all out? Just becomes more and more fluid and easy to navigate. We got to get to a place where it's real time. And I'm not saying we're anywhere mm -hmm. near that, but yeah. that that would be the ultimate we're goal. We're closer. Yeah, we're a lot with, closer with, than we've ever been. The, but, I think what's know. interesting about this is that we're we're going like, yeah, 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 we can we can pretty much almost real time translate Mandarin into English. That's not hard anymore. Like that fascinates me. They're like what's hard is could we translate all the languages? Could we make mm -hmm. a, a literally universal translator? That is an extraordinarily hard problem. Like we we've, yeah. we've done the easy part. The the stuff that we have a lot of data on that we can train. And I'm fascinated by this project. I think this is a worthy project to say like let's try to make this as 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 good as possible with the ultimate goal of could we make a what the universal translator is in Star Trek, which is something that just picks up context and figures out how to translate two entirely different languages from alien species? Uh, we we are at least just working with the one species. But imagine if we got really good, if we got close to those six thousand languages working, maybe we could translate dolphin. Yeah, like, I mean, could you we said start to translate other. Use the right word too. Context matters so much. Even Google Translate kind of has a hard time. I have this little thing I do back and forth with our own Patrick Beja, where I he'll he'll, he'll tweet something as he often does in French. Mm -hmm. I'll convert it to English, and then repost it as a reply, because there's always some goofy thing wrong with it. Like it's, well, it's that, not that, exactly right. That's the right. downside of this. Is like yeah. there machine translations are always going to miss nuance. They're, they're all, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future anyway. There's, you're, you're never going to be able to 100% rely on them because there's some pretty crazy examples of 
them getting things wrong and causing problems. I just mm-hmm. remember when text to pe- text to speech didn't work at all, and look at yeah. us now. So you know, yeah. we may get there. Well, more than 30 government websites, including the Ministry of Defense, were hacked and defaced to show pictures of someone holding a machine gun. You probably think we're talking about Ukraine, but we're not. Ukrainian government websites and some Ukrainian banks have been DDoSed, flooded with traffic, making them hard to access. But in the southwestern African country of Mozambique, pretty far from Ukraine, attackers got control of the websites and put up messages attributed to Yemeni hackers. There's a civil war currently being fought in Yemen. Among Mozambique's breach sites were the portals of the National Disaster Management, Roads Administration, and Water Agencies. Big deal. The head of Mozambique's National Institute of Electronic Government, Herminio Jassy, said that no personal data was accessed and the sites had been restored as of Monday. But as of Wednesday, the attackers regained control, saying they had completely infiltrated 34 ministries. The attackers want ransoms to be paid or they say they'll release confidential data. This is a big attack. Well, let's ask ourselves, if the names of the countries weren't Mozambique and Yemen, would this not be a really big story in the world today? Now, you may have heard of it, but you likely haven't. And I ask the panel today, why not? Why have we not heard more about this? Yeah, there's 31 million people in Mozambique, give or take. Uh, That's a lot. That's a lot of people. Uh, And, you know, they're... There are similarly sized countries in Europe uh, and smaller. You know, if, if Luxembourg had its its stuff taken down, this would be pretty big news. Mm-hmm. If France had its stuff taken down, it'd be gargantuan news. Uh, is it just because we expect like, oh, Mozambique uh, maybe isn't as sophisticated, like maybe there's an assumption and therefore, but this is the first time this has ever happened. It's It's not like they get hacked all the time. Also, if I'm a Yemeni hacker, I would probably not pick Mozambique as my first target. So I'm a little confused there, which makes it a more interesting story to me. Like, why exactly. go after Mozambique? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was it because there was a vulnerability? Were they just trolling around and this is the one they found? Uh, lots of lots of questions here. But I feel like because it's a smaller country that is not in Europe, we don't hear about it. Yeah. Part, part of what threw me with this one, I guess I have the unfortunate honor of knowing somebody who's in Mozambique right now and works for the State Department, some old neighbors of mine, and uh, their whole family there, a bunch of kids and, and uh, the mom and dad. And he works for the State Department, and I am sure is in the midst of this. Like, this must be a big deal for them as an outreach arm of the United States government. And I guess by knowing them and knowing this, I suddenly have a more connected view of it, sure. or, or I'm more like, oh my gosh, that's big news. And I think that's it. I think we just maybe people aren't, you know, we don't it's hear about Mozambique all the time. I mean, yeah, if we yeah. did, we would. And if we didn't, we don't. And and so, yeah, you're right, Tom. If this was anything else, if this was a tiny country, but we all knew about it, or if this was a city, like, I don't know, if someone said it was Hong Kong, we'd be freaking out. But if it was a smaller province in China we've never heard of, nobody would talk about it. So I think it's just really down to that. What are we used to? What do we know? And if we know somebody there, it means it's a bigger deal to us. Otherwise, it's a statistic we miss. Which, you know, yeah, I think, I think what what yeah. what made this catch my eye was I saw so many stories about Ukrainian hacks, most of them saying Ukrainian hacks might get worse, which is basically reporting on something that hasn't happened yet. That's why I'm glad you said, Sarah, that like, yeah, there's some DDoS is going on. There are this is what's actually happening there. And yet BBC doesn't even have a, a straight up story about this. I had to go to BBC's topic page where they sort of blog in real time about stuff. And News24.com, which is a South African source, had it uh, as well. So mm-hmm. I, you know. I, uh, I did. I, I had a, a similar thought to you where I was like, hmm, why Mozambique? And yes, m- uh, searches of Yemen, Mozambique together, uh, you know, that countries are, you know, you get search results that compare population numbers or you know, how much water is in the country. It's, it has nothing to do with the story. It's hard to, it's hard to believe that no one else has gone, huh, that's interesting. Why Mozambique? And then has written something about it that at least surfaced for me. All right, let's switch over to 3G. Well, not for long because it's going away. (laughs) Uh, In 2002, 
Uh, I remember Ken Ray and I covering the launch of 3G networks in Europe and places like that on Tech TV Radio. Uh, by 2007, the iPhone launched on Edge, a 2G network. It wasn't even until 2008 that the iPhone launched on 3G. LTE started showing up on phones around 2010, and 20 years after those first 3G networks were launched, as 5G rolls out more and more, carriers are calling time on 3G. Now, this has happened before. 2G services like Edge were shut off, and every time it does, some services that never moved off the system get left behind. So where are we at? The U.S. has AT&T already shut down as of Tuesday, February 22nd. T-Mobile's shutting its 3G down March 31st, and Verizon's shutting its 3G down December 31st. Uh, Europe has already shut down a lot of its networks, starting with Vodafone Zigo in February 2020. Shutdowns are kind of staggered by service and country uh, between now and 2025. Telenor shutting down 3G in Sweden in December 2025. That's the longest one I could find. NTT Docomo, the first to launch commercial service in Japan, is going to turn off its 3G in March 2026. So first in, for last out, I guess. Uh, if you want to find out about your region, Enmity.com has a comprehensive chart on what 3G services are going away, when and where. And here in the U.S., CNET's David Lum has a great down, rundown of what's happening for folks here. The short version is if your phone is from 2015 or later, you got LTE, so you won't lose service. Uh, of the millions of subscribers to carrier services, the total number of people that have 3G only in their phone, that is no LTE, uh, is in the hundreds of thousands. Besides phones, there are also some other things, older car navigation systems, alarm systems, ebook readers, IoT devices uh, that use 3G, that have built-in 3G connections. RCR Wireless estimates there's about 80 million 3G devices in use just in North America alone uh, as of 2019. But Entner followed up on that number and says, you know, people have switched off a lot of those. It's only about 5 million now. If the hardware for LTE or 5G isn't in a device, you can't upgrade it. So when 3G service shuts off, it loses that avenue for connecting to the internet. If it doesn't have Wi-Fi, it's offline altogether. Most manufacturers are offering discounts and other ways to encourage upgrades. A lot of alarm companies like ADT will send a technician to your house, give you the new modem as part of your existing plan. If you haven't heard from your manufacturer or service provider, you should contact them, see what they offer. Uh, if you are like, oh, wait, I've got a device that only uses 3G. With IoT devices, you, you might just have to pay for a new device. Whenever this happens, we see a lot of stories saying services should stay up as long as people are using them. Do, do you think they should, though? Like, you, you got to move on. You got to free up that spectrum for the next G. Yeah, if you've got a, you know, I'm trying to think of any IoT device that I think would be impacted by the loss of 3G. And I don't think I have any. Uh, my phone turns to 3G all the time because uh, there are lots of dead zones around where I live when I get out of my own Wi-Fi range. Um, but, you know, my phone has LTE, so that's what I'm always looking for anyway. <laughs> Just the, the dreaded 1X. That's that's the only thing I really don't want. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're if you're of the uh, if, if you're the owner or you're you still love one of the 5 million 3G devices that are just going to stop working. That sucks. Bad news, right? I'm yeah. sure there's folks out there going, "Well, crap. I don't want to buy something new. I you know, I'm now I'm being forced into it." But yes, we are moving forward. 5G will become what 3G was not that long ago. That's how it goes. And unfortunately, sometimes hardware has to die because of it. Yeah. This seems like the kind of thing, we're going to talk more about preservation in a minute, about a whole other story, but uh, it's the kind of thing that can be preserved in some technical ways. Like, um, you know, I, I have to imagine somebody somewhere in their cool ham radio basement has got a nice 3D transponder receiver sender set up where he could say, oh, yeah, back in the mid-aughts, late aughts, we used to, this is how we used to communicate on our phone, you know, whatever. So that stuff can hang around. But yeah, as usual, progress pushes the old stuff out and we have to get with the new. Yeah. The, the, the key is preparing for it in advance. Usually what happens with these shutdowns is most stuff is handled well. Manufacturers do what they need to do to, to get you onto new devices. But there's always a slice. It's usually a small slice, but there's always a slice of horror stories of where like, you know, this particular medical device or that particular security device uh, nobody got around to, to dealing with or couldn't afford to deal with, and it, and it just went away. And that that's sad when you know this stuff has a lifetime. So maybe what we learned from this is, uh, hey, 5G devices, make sure you, you build in uh, an exit route for when 5G goes away in 20 years. 
Uh, if you have a thought about this or anything on the show, uh, why aren't you emailing us? Electronic mail. It's been around longer than 3G. Email us. <laughs> feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Do it now. Last week, Nintendo announced it's no longer going to sell Wii U and 3DS games in its eShops after March of next year. This is not happening tomorrow. They're giving you a whole year, actually more than a year, to get ready, March of 2023. Uh, but if you still use a Wii U or a 3DS, that shop is going to go away. In fact, it's going to go away in stages. Starting May 23rd, you'll no longer be able to add funds to your account with a credit card. And then after August 29th, you won't be able to add funds with a gift card, which would be your workaround until August. And everything, including download codes, uh, Nintendo wallet account funds, will stop being usable in the eShops, again, just for Wii U and 3DS, starting in late March next year. You'll still be able to re-download your purchased games. If you bought something, you can always go back and get it. You can get your downloadable content. You can get software updates. You can even play online. None of that's going away on these devices, quote, for the foreseeable future. It's just the ability to buy new stuff that's going to be going away more than a year from now. But Scott, as positively as I have spun this, it's not all rosy, is it? No, in fact, this time maybe less rosy than ever. Uh, and I, I don't know if that's just the culmination of time or where we're at in terms of um, our ability to preserve uh, games and other digital content, or maybe just our attitude toward this stuff has changed. I don't know, but uh, Nintendo is taking considerable heat for this for this move, and it's not that different than moves they've made in the past with other other outdated devices. Uh, you can't, you know, log in, for example, to a DS store, just the regular DS or a 2DS or, well, the 2DS is part of the 3DS ecosystem, so I suppose that's still around. But, but the point is, the minute Nintendo got into the world of you can download stuff from some digital place is the day that the clock started ticking. And now that stuff's all coming due, and everybody's like, well, wait a minute, where am I going to get it? Now, most of the time, the PC world's been doing this for decades, the stuff you bought 10 years ago still runs because Windows still runs it and PC still run it. And so you can play games that are very old and no problem. Uh, you can play, uh, th and this is also true in a lot of console stuff moving forward. It's more recent, but this is pretty much Microsoft from here forward. They have, you know, as much backwards compatible as you would expect them to do. They even have more coming. Um, and as they move further along, the idea is that, well, if you bought it here, you bought it everywhere. Uh, Sony a little slower to adopt that idea, but in the case of Nintendo, they have always been like, well, that's it. We're done. Party's over. Uh, you're not going to be able to get these games here anymore and maybe never see those games ever again in terms of them being available someplace else or somewhere new. Like right now, you can go to the Switch online service and pay four bucks a month and have access to a handful of SNES and regular NES video games. You can pay a little bit more and get some N64 and Genesis games. Uh, but they are a tiny, tiny fraction <clears throat> of what was available on, say, the virtual console. That was like 530 games available on the VC, which was a service offered on Wii, Wii U, and 3DS. That's not there anymore. Now, that wasn't a subscription, so you didn't just get like a one price and then you can have everything. You had to buy these games individually. Whereas the Switch system, the Switch Online system, is a subscription with a bunch of games thrown in. And I can tell, I don't even know if this is that shocking, but I can tell the Nintendo doesn't want to throw the whole thing in there and say, here's every game we've ever made for the Super Nintendo, have at it for your measly four bucks a month. There's probably a happier medium there. But the big complaint gamers have with Nintendo has always been, Nintendo will say, well, don't pirate our stuff and don't make ROMs and don't share them. Okay, fine, let us buy your game someplace. And Nintendo doesn't have a good answer for that. They're like, well, you bought it back when you had a Wii. Yeah, but Wiis are all dead, and you can't find new ones, and it's super expensive to find that stuff now, and we're happy to pay again if we can have it on a, a modern platform. They just don't have the headspace for this. At least they haven't demonstrated that. And, and so. I, I think that's the problem, right? As we talked about with 3G going away, you know, you can't keep tech around forever. I don't expect to be able to go to down to the store and buy a Commodore 64 game brand new, right? Like, I get it. You have to sunset stuff. But where it rubs people the wrong way is you're stopping us from preserving games. Right. Uh, in fact, Nintendo is part of the Entertainment Software Association, which has been asking for a rejection of the Library of Congress's exemption for recreating online games, uh, games that, that need a server to play. Uh, 
games. And yet Nintendo's not making those available. So there's a gap of games that, sure, maybe not a lot of people want to play, but for historical purposes, like if you're part of the Video Game History Foundation or an organization like that, you just want to be able to preserve them, and it's illegal for you to do that, and Nintendo's not allowing you any other way to do it. Yeah, and the, the comparison I used this morning was if it, it's a little bit like saying, sorry, um, your Walkman is the last place you're going to be able to play Bob Dylan music. I'm sorry, no <laughs> yeah. more Bob Dylan. So forget it. Sorry. Uh, maybe we'll bring Bob Dylan out later sometime, but you know, you won't know when, and we'll have it in our fake vault that doesn't really exist. Like it, th That kind of mentality seems silly when you apply it to other kinds of media, yeah. Why video games get a get a pass on that is still very confusing to me and a lot of other a lot of other people. Yeah, it's fine if you don't want to port games over to the Nintendo Switch service, but don't block fair use historical research. You can limit right. it. They're like, ah, but if we do that, slippery slope, piracy will happen. It's like, well, okay, but also piracy can happen in a lot of cases and 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 often doesn't. Also uh, in this case, you I guarantee you people will get the ROMs, preserve them in the way they can because Nintendo's not helping, and they'll do it in a way that Nintendo doesn't like, and it's going to be worse than if they were active participants in the preservation process. I think this is a big mistake on their part. Yeah. How many roads must Nintendo walk down <laughs> before it gets game preservation? <laughs> Would you like to talk about smart birds? Yeah. Little dinosaurs. Good. You know I, I mean, even if you didn't, I was going to do it anyway. Uh, when researchers attached little backpack-like tracking devices to five Australian magpies for a pilot study to learn more about the movement and social dynamics of this very highly intelligent type of bird, they discovered a new social behavior that they didn't even mean to discover. The magpies begin cooperatively rescuing each other to remove these little backpacks, these harnesses, that were holding the trackers in place. Now the magpies were first trained to come to an outdoor feeding station. That station could either wire wirelessly charge the battery of the tracker, download data from the tracker, or release the tracker and harness by using a magnet. The researchers were pretty confident that these these were snug, these were snug harnesses. Sure, there was a magnet, that was sort of the fail point, but how are the magpies gonna know anything about magnets? But they noticed but but within about 10 minutes of fitting the final tracker, an adult female who didn't have a tracker on started using her bill to remove the harness off of a younger bird. Three days later, all five magpies had successfully shed their tracking devices because, you know, teamwork. Dominique Potvin, a senior lecturer in animal ecology at the University of the Sunshine Coast, wrote in the conversation that tracking magpies is crucial for conservation efforts due to increasing frequency and intensity of heat waves under climate change. So the researchers were doing good work already, but they ended up with a finding they had no idea they were about to find. Yeah, the, the backlash against privacy invasion has reached the magpies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're they are wickedly smart birds. We have magpies really here in yeah. some volume, and they every That's spring and summer, if you yeah. see a magpie, you need to keep your eyes open. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I, I just what imagine one do? of the magpies going like, <laughs> "Pick your hey, lock." Hey, Pat, you got something right there. Guy, let me let me get that off of you. I don't know if you realize it was there. Let, let, let no, it me. happens all the time. People say, "Where's my phone, magpies? Where's my keys, magpies?" <laughs> Right. They know what they're doing. The researchers yeah. said after they had, because they had actually uh, visually observed this this magpie taking taking the tracker off of the the younger, smaller magpie. They said we don't know for sure if it wasn't just this one magpie who was just like a all of you. Smart magpie, we're yeah. all getting our trackers taken off, or it if it was you know sort of the activist magpie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it was or learned behavior that all the other magpies had picked up, but something that uh, they instinctively wanted to help each other do and it took very little time at all very cool very Kinda interesting yeah. yeah all right let's check out the mailbag josh has a question for you scott josh's question is why do we still have to choose between 4k versus 60 frames per second on the new get consoles is it computing limitation or just that devs aren't ready to put in the work Josh says, I personally prefer the higher frame rate, but really curious why in 2022 we still have this compromise. Okay, so there's a couple of things to hit here. One is a more complicated uh, thing, which is there are games that can hit both 4K and 60 frames per second or 4K and 120 frames per second. Those exist on these new consoles, but they're not the ones he's probably thinking of. He's thinking of, well, why doesn't... Um, 
the new uh, uh, Forbidden West game. Uh, why, what's what's the deal Horizon, there? I, th yeah. I should be able to do both, and that's one. That's a good example actually, because right now I'm running the preferred frame rate over the uh, resolution fidelity because I just think it looks better and runs better. Um, here's the problem with games like that that are massively high fidelity, and you're talking about you know the the, the big flagship AAA stuff that you're paying seventy bucks for. Those games simply want you to do more than those devices are capable of. And the reason you were able to afford a $399 console or $499, whatever they are, is because they skimped a little on like cutting edge GPU stuff. If you want that stuff, you can get it on a PC and spend $1,500 or more for a video card capable of the 120 or the 60 plus, plus 4K. Those are all possible in those scenarios, but you pay for it. So as awesome as new, these new consoles are, and they've got some really cool technology under the hood, the, the simple answer is they're not as powerful as we think they are. <laughs> they're okay. They do great. And they're better than the last ones, no doubt. But, you know, in another 10 years, we'll be glad to, to bump up to whatever's next. And PCs will be lapping that as well. And it's okay. This isn't PC Master Race talk. This is just the way that tech has always evolved. And it's, you know, once you get used to it, it's fine. Yeah, eventually we'll just play everything streamed online anyway. Yeah. It's all going to get weird before it gets less weird. So... <laughs> Enjoy the weird. Well, if you have questions for Scott or Tom or me or Roger or anybody on the show, uh, please do send them in. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Also want to extend a special thanks to James C. Smith, one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. James, you may have noticed, we also thanked you at the top of the show. Double you, thanks. You were next on the list, so you get a <laughs> double thanks today, James. Thank you for all the years of support. Also, thank you to all your years of support, Scott Johnson. Couldn't do it without you. Uh, let folks know what you've been up to. That's very nice. If you're, uh, if you're, if this talk of preserving old games is uh, piquing your interest, I have a whole show about retro gaming, and a lot of those discussions are about how do we, how do we preserve them. People probably don't know this, but NHL '95, a very popular hockey game in 1994. Sorry, NHL '94, uh, very popular then, still extremely popular now. And uh, we talk about why that is and how that got preserved and the community that got built around it and why it's still relevant today. If that sounds interesting, check it out. We're Play Retro, wherever you get your podcasts, or you can find us at frogpants.com slash play retro. Excellent. Well, we are live on this here show, Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'd love to have you join us live if you can. We're back tomorrow doing it all again with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you soon. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>